So anyways, thank you very much uh, everyone for being here in this afternoon session on polymer engineering. Uh, we have four presentations. I'll give an introductory presentation on the Polymer Engineering Center at the university. Then our second speaker will be Professor Natalie Rudolph, who will speak about her research in the area of additive manufacturing. Then we'll have a graduate student speaking, Tom Mulholland, who will speak about his research. And then we have finding somebody from industry, which is Paul Graman, who actually got his PhD with us uh, 21 years ago. 21 years ago, yeah, and actually was my first student that worked in my lab, uh, starting in 1989, so he was president of the Madison Group. So <clears throat> we have a very uh, group um, and a very uh, set of presentations. Uh, so I, <coughs> and mine is just a little overview uh, of what we do at the, uh, what my group does at the Palm Engineering Center, and I'm sure Professor Rudolph will introduce and her that work. Uh, we work also, of course, with industrial partners. I think it's, it's common in the area of manufacturing. Uh, we have research projects uh, with uh, the auto industry, both VW and Toyota, VW in Germany and Toyota uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We work with Teal Plastics, which is an exclusion company uh, here in Wisconsin. Uh, we work also with Savic, that is a, is a resin supplier. They're the ones who manufacture Stamax. Uh, which is the, the fiber, uh, long fiber reinforced thermoplastic pellet. And we work with uh, Bosch company in Germany, which is a manufacturer, it's a supplier for the auto industry. And we work for Orlikon, uh, <coughs> uh, extrusion fiber uh, uh, manufacturing company. And we also uh, have a relationship with Netsch, that is a company that makes uh, analytical equipment and differential scanning calorimetries. And all that. there are other companies that are associated with the Palm Engineering Center, but this gives a, a nice uh, overview. <clears throat> there are different projects uh, that we work on, and uh, one of them is uh, a, a high-pressure rheometer. In this case here, we actually, let me see if this, I guess, oh, there we go, it does, it does work. Uh, we <clears throat> want to, in some processing, and particularly when we manufacture really thin parts, uh, we're going to be using huge pressures, uh, and those huge pressures affect the viscosity uh, of the material. And so we uh, developed a, a rheometer, it's a slit rheometer, you can see this slit there, uh, where we measure the flow past that slit uh, uh, through a pressure transducer, so we can assess uh, the pressure drop. We place pellets inside, the pellets are heated, uh, so that the, the whole system is put into a frame, <clears throat> the heaters are turned on, that causes the pellets uh, or the powder uh, to melt. Uh, then we adjust uh, the rheometer until everything is under pressure, uh, so the whole system is pressurized to a certain level of pressure, and then <clears throat> uh, the pistons move back and forth, causing the material to flow past the slit at different levels of pressure, so we can assess uh, the re rheology of the material uh, under, under uh, uh, pressure. So this is a PhD project that is, is, is going on with one of my uh, graduate students. And you can perform some measurements <coughs> then of uh, viscosity instead of as a function of temperature, uh, we do it as a function of pressure. Obviously, we can also uh, introduce the, 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 the temperature. <coughs> so this is one set of uh, uh, projects uh, that, that we're working on. Uh, there's other uh, projects, for example, we have one where we combine ultrasound and Raman uh, spectroscopy uh, to assess, for example, what happens to thermosetting resins uh, during, during uh, processing. So we, we built a chamber. The chamber uh, is used uh, through Raman spectroscopy to determine what levels uh, of curing uh, we have, what, uh, uh, where we are in the curing reaction. And at the same time, we can send an ultrasound signal uh, to measure the speed of sound, the speed of sound uh, we related to the modulus that is developing during cure, uh, and so we can match then curing uh, with um, uh, with uh, 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 modulus. So, for example, the Raman system, <coughs> what's, uh, there are such certain peaks that will tell you, for example, double bonds. Double bonds uh, get depleted as the material cures. Uh, and, so, and so that peak that, that has the, the double bonds, that, that particular wavelength starts going down. And so the height of the peak will tell us how many double bonds there are, which actually tells us uh, the degree of cure. And so here we can see, for example, this peak right here goes down to this level as the material cures. And so we can use that peak 
there uh, to be able to determine uh, <coughs> to determine what the degree of cure is as a function of time. On the other hand, the speed of sound in time also increases, and so we can relate then uh, the, 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 the modulus and, uh, and the cure uh, and, and find ways to be able to predict that as material cure. We need to know that, for example, for uh, manufacturing uh, complex structures, like for example, this would be an L-shaped uh, structure that is a, a typical way of manufacturing parts for aircraft industries. In this case here, it's, a, it's an epoxy carbon fiber uh, a system, and we then uh, would uh, use the data, uh, the mechanical data as a function of cure, uh, to simulate and predict, for example, what spring, spring, spring forward uh, uh, the, the part has, uh, or uh, what warpage the part will exhibit uh, during, during, uh, during cure, uh, during the process. So, so here, here we're matching measurements with simulation. Etc. So that's another kind of uh, uh, related uh, uh, project. Uh, uh, in this case, here not rheology, but rather um, uh, uh, curing in, 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 in solid mechanics. And we have another project that we developed, uh, uh, have been working on for a few years, uh, and this is a project of actually making powder uh, in additive manufacturing. Uh, one of the most expensive things that we have is the powder that is used, for example, for selective laser sintering manufacturing um, and also for sintering pr uh, uh, processes, etc. And in the powder manufacturing, <coughs> these powders can be $100 or so a pound. And so what we have done is devised a technique uh, where we can make powder uh, by breaking it up, uh, by breaking the polymer up uh, with high streams or fast streams of air so that the polymer is extruded through a very small capillary, and as the material exits, uh, hot air blows around it and breaks it down uh, into small uh, particles. There are two effects that can be uh, uh, char characterized uh, to break up the material. One of them is Raleigh disturbances, which is the same thing that occurs when you take a shower every morning. What hits your head is not a continuous stream, but individual droplets except, of course, polymers have a huge viscosity, so we need a very high rate of deformation to be able to break it up. So that's the first effect, or melt fractures, the other one. So those two effects cause a breakup, and actually we have two patents uh, that were applied for and, and, and we received uh, to make the powder. This is a, a, a running um, a, a, a project, so we can make uh, a, a particles with different uh, sizes, different length distributions, uh, etc. So here you can see um, uh, some set of particles with certain process conditions, and here we see other set of particles with other <coughs> process conditions. This is the cumulative uh, 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 size distribution. So, for example, the red line, 50% uh, of all the particles uh, would be under 300 micrometers in size. So it's, a, it's fairly small and, uh, particles. The other thing that we're interested in, obviously here you can see small particles, but they are, they are fairly elongated, and, and so we want that the spherical particles and, uh, that have a nice flow ability. And, and so here we have also the distribution of the, of the, of, of the length distribution. So a one means a perfectly spherical particle, and then of course they become more and more elongated. So the red line uh, would, have, uh, would have this uh, size distribution or this uh, uh, length dis uh, L over D distribution. So we're doing all kinds of experimental work to be able to assess our process and to understand a little bit better and, 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 and how to control it. And for that, we're also doing simulation work. So here you see high-speed photography of the micropelletizing process. You can see the Raleigh disturbances growing here and the, as the particles are forming. And, and this, is, this is the same effect. This is, this is the simulation, same process, uh, except simulation, simulating it. So we're trying to relate uh, 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 viscosities. We're trying to relate <coughs> uh, um, uh, relaxation times Etc. To the actual uh, to the actual size distribution of the and length distribution of the particles. <clears throat> That's a whole other research uh, uh, activity that we have. And another one that we have is is dealing with fiber composites. So we have a whole research project that deals with long and short fiber reinforced uh, uh, thermoplastics and uh, thermosets. Uh, we're interested in the orientation of fibers that reinforce the material and the density distribution of the fibers, but also in the length distribution as the fibers become shorter during the process. 
And so what we do is we have a model where we model each fiber individually as, an, as, an, as, as a single, single body and then they join all the fibers and simulate their interactions and, and, and using very complex uh, simulation. So for example, here we have um, a sheet molding compound, an initial orientation sheet molding compound. Uh, we then generate a charge that will be compression molded with sheet molding compound. It, this obviously is very difficult to put a lot of fibers into a small space. And so what we do is we, we make a big, long, big volume with very low volume fraction, in this case 3%. And then uh, we crunch it down to increase from a 3% volume fraction down to 30% volume fraction. Now we have a charge that emulates the charge during sheet molding compound that can now be squeezed to generate different types of flows to assess the fiber interaction coefficients and, 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 and other aspects. So here we have the charge. The charge is then squeezed in a one directional flow. And as the charge is squeezed, the fibers are oriented. There's all kinds of other things, also fiber matrix separation. So if we look at the squeezing of the charge from the top, <coughs> you notice that the edge of the charge moves a little bit faster than the, than the fibers. That means at the end of processing, your edge of the plate is going to have very few fibers and a lot of resin, which is an effect that, that is uh, very important for the auto industry. The hood of the car, the trunk lid of the car sometimes crumbles. The edge of it crumbles because there are no fibers there, and that's due to the fiber matrix separation effect. But also, the fibers that uh, were, have originally had a nearly random orientation at the end of flow uh, have a certain orientation distribution this is if we had a, a two-thirds of the mold cavity filled. This is if we had half of the uh, cavity filled. The red bars, this is our mechanistic model simulation. Uh, the, the dark boxes are experiments that Tucker and Jackson did in 1985. And you can see we can match our simulation fairly well with the ex existing experiments. And ultimately, we don't want our, mo our sim simulation to be used, but what we want to be using is continuum models. But using our simulation, we can assess the properties of the material as it flows and determine what interaction coefficients we have. And so here you can see uh, uh, that, we, that using our simulation, instead of the experiments from Folger and Tucker, we can actually uh, 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 gather the information, find the interaction coefficients that actually uh, emulate the flow really well. So we can eliminate really expensive testing uh, by using uh, this type of simulation. Other things, but more complex simulations. So this is this is the Tucker Advani uh, Advani tensors. Uh, we have two constants, Ci, and we have kappa. Uh, so Ci determines the higher the interaction, uh, the lower the, the the lower the orientation, the final orientation that something will reach. So Ci controls the orientation, and kappa controls how fast that orientation uh, is reached. And so we can use our simulation. Uh, by, uh, by having, for example, these um, uh, the, the, uh, small cells, shear cells, uh, to determine what orientation develops with our model and then, and, and then match the analytical solutions to actually determine what is kappa and ci for the actual simulation using mold filling simulations. And so in, in this case here, <coughs> our simulation are the, are the blue boxes and then the more complex uh, uh, Tucker uh, Phelps simulation is the red line. And we match our red line, uh, the red line of, of, the, of the Phelps Tucker simulation with our mechanistic model uh, by varying CI and kappa. So we find the CI and kappa that can now be used to, 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 to model complex mold fitting simulations without having done any uh, uh, experimental analysis. And so then we can introduce our CI and kappa to a mold filling simulation such as mold X3D or mold flow. <coughs> and we can then uh, show, for example, what orientation distributions uh, develop. So if we use the, the default values from mold X3D, we get a, a fairly poor uh, orientation in the center core of the, of the, of the part uh, by using our uh, CI and kappa. We get a little bit closer in, in the, between the simulated and the measured uh, results. But they're still not quite a match. And so the question is, is, is what's going on. That kind of raised the question for us is, how come we can never actually match the simulation with the actual experimental work? And that's with other work that we're doing, which is measuring. We also measure the orientation, the final part. And so we use micro CT uh, to, and, 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 and different techniques to actually measure 
<coughs> the orientation. So we have, we have, here we have the micro CT image on the, on the right hand side, uh, right here. Here we have the orientation uh, tensors. You can see very oriented at the, at the edge uh, uh, in, in one direction, very oriented at the center in the opposite direction. Uh, and so, and, but what you also see is a fiber density distribution. We have a huge difference, about 70% in fiber volume fraction between the edges and the center of the part. And so if we, uh, if we look and see, uh, you can see the orientation of our changes. There now, suddenly the orientation changes to 90 degrees, to up, upwards, and then it goes back and oriented in the zero degree direction. <clears throat> but the center part, has a much higher concentration of fibers, which means we don't have an equal volume fraction, which means we can't match our results. So simulations today have to actually change and include the volume fraction to be able to have a variable CI throughout the domain. And so it's not just a constant for one material, but it's, it's a constant that needed it. So it's a research project that is continuing. That's, that's what the auto industry, Savvy, uh, <coughs> and Bosch uh, are interested in. And so. I think we did pretty good. I think it's about 60 minutes. So I, I hope I didn't go too fast. But this at least gives you a flavor. We go all the way from simulation, measurement uh, uh, techniques uh, to assess uh, processes and to assess the materials the finished, uh, in the finished uh, product. And any questions? We developed our own software for that. So, so we, we, we spit the powders on top of a piece of glass uh, and scan it. Uh, and then, this, the, the, then we, do an, we have an image analysis <coughs> that, that matches then an ellipse to each one of the particles and finds the, the length and the, and, and the ratio, but also the size distribution. So you developed that in-house? In-house, yeah. Wow. yeah. And, so, and so we can actually do 20, 30,000 uh, uh, particles with no problem. We also have the same technique we use also to measure uh, fiber length distribution, because that was a big issue. Uh, and so we, 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 uh, we do that. The orientation we measure actually with the technique we developed years ago, uh, which is what we call a slit technique. So we take an image and we, we rotate a slit and, and we find the intensity of the projected image. And that's related to the orientation distribution function. Yeah? Back to you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the mechanistic model, uh, what we have, and I went through it very, very quickly, uh, we assume that, the, that there is a, a, an interaction between, between the matrix and the, and the fiber, so that's a hydrodynamic effect. Uh, so the matrix drags the fiber, but the fibers touch each other also, so they don't, they're not allowed uh, to, to measure. So we do assume perfect adhesion with the, with the matrix to the fiber, but we know that the matrix doesn't move as fast as the fiber, or faster than the fiber. The fibers actually slow down. And, and that's, that's why what we actually solve for is the velocity of the fiber. So that's the unknown in our, in our, in our process. And we are assuming, so for the finished part, uh, that there is a good adhesion, that the sizing is perfect, that at the end you get the maximum uh, uh, effect of the composite. Yeah. Uh, yes? Could you measure the modulus at a surface with the ultrasound and during curing, <laughs> yeah, I, what we do is, if, if, and, and that is kind of tricky. If we have, if we have a, a, a small plate, uh, what we do would measure is measure an average modulus through the thickness, and it's not on, at the surface. There may be a way to actually do that at the surface uh, as well. And the other thing, one of my graduate students actually also measured <coughs> by by having. A, a, uh, uh, longitudinal wave and also having a shear wave move through, we can actually combine the two to find the anisotropic uh, properties. So find the modulus E11, E22, uh, G12, and all that. You can actually use that as well. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, the surface and this this guy, there's probably a way to do it if it's thick enough, uh, and it may, it maybe there are fibers inside. Uh, that it bounces off of, uh, right at this, so to just measure what happens to the resin at the surface or so. Yeah. Interesting.
question. Okay, so I think we are out of time uh, anyway, so I'll give the, the, uh, <coughs> the podium uh, to my colleague, uh, Natalie Rudolph, um, who has, has been a professor in our department for the past two years, and she joined us uh, from a, a, a job that she worked on at, at a Fraunhofer Institute um, in, uh, in Augsburg, Germany, uh, that, that deals with continuous fiber uh, composites in one of her big areas of 